good. Good to see you all. Good to be back here with the family. If you are new here, we want to welcome you. We want to extend a very warm, warm welcome to you, especially on behalf of our pastor, Pastor Tim, uh, who him and a couple other men and their wives are currently down in Tennessee. They're down there for the Yetis Conference, the Yetis Music Conference. And so they'll be there until like Friday, coming up this upcoming Friday. So, and then we also have some people who are missing that's traveling as well. So just keep them in prayer as they are away. I know that they are excited to be down there, but they, they miss us in spirit. And so um, I'm just praising the Lord that I get to be, be standing before you this morning and to thank you this truth. Um, you know, I know that I have a reputation of being loud, so hopefully I'm going to hear something bad. But I want to share something with you, um, very personal. Um, about 13 years ago, I found out that I had a uh, a target on me, uh, like a bounty on me, a bounty on my head. And even today, that bounty still stands. And at best. He wants to see me dead. He wants to see me no longer alive. And at least, he wants to make sure that I live for false and empty promises. That I, I'm hopeless. That I'm destitute. That I'm without. And I want to tell you, if you're a Christian today, you have the same enemy who has a target on you. Who desires for your life to be over, and, and, and at least, if you can't do that, to make it seem like everything else is worth living for than what you were created for. Amen. And so I want to encourage us today that we started a series just this past, this past Sunday, and so we're going to continue in it. This is going to be part two. But I just want to encourage us today that, yes, we do face spiritual warfare as Christians. We are, as soon as we are born again, as, as Jesus puts it, as soon as we enter into that family, we are enlisted into the Lord's army. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm in the Lord's army. I may never ride, shoot the enemy. I may never Saying you are in the Lord's army. You are enlisted. And therefore, we are in battle daily. We have an enemy who is after us daily. I'm so glad I was taught that song um, at the age of 15 and, and in Sunday school. I, I love it. I go back to it often. But it's a great reminder. You see, Satan knows that while we're still here, we're doing God's bidding. We're living, or well, supposed to be living for him. Every aspect of our life for him. And therefore, Satan doesn't like that because Satan opposes everything of God. The Bible says that God desires that none should perish, but that all reach repentance. And if that is what God desires, then guess what? You can believe that Satan hates that very thing. He doesn't want to see anybody repent because he knows what that means. He's on a mission to disrupt God's will. Which it cannot be, by the way. Hallelujah. God's will cannot be disrupted. Amen? Amen. But he tries anyway. He's stubborn. Nonetheless. And that means by any means necessary, he's trying. Any means necessary. You see, you and I are his targets at every given second of the day. As you know, as we'll read in the text, we'll be jumping back into our text in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13, like we did last week. This is going to be kind of like a part two. But as we'll see, he and his forces, they are not without strategy. Satan has many tricks up his sleeve. And if you and I will, and, 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 
it's imperative for us to understand that so that we can know our enemy and how he operates. If you're in battle, if you're in some kind of combat, you must know your enemy. You must know what tricks they have up their sleeves. So if you're using one of the Bibles in front of you or around you, that's going to be on page 979, 979. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 10. And go through all the way to 13. <clears throat> and it reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Let's pray. Father God, as we are before your word, as I open my mouth to utter anything, may it be you, your spirit, leading me, guiding me, not just for the sake of me, but for the sake of the hearers, for the sake of your glory. Help us today to worship you at this time. Help us to see, Lord, our enemy for who he really is. Let us not be no longer deceived and outwitted by him. Let this be a time that we come together and praise you because we know at the end of the day he is already a defeated foe. Hallelujah. And so we just praise you in that. No need to fear. But I thank you for your word today. I thank you for what you're going to do and what you've already started doing, Lord, and what you're going to complete one day. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So last week, Pastor Tim started this series, and it's called Call to God's War. And the big idea of this series is that spiritual warfare is real. And we must take it and take heed to the instructions that God has given us on how to engage in spiritual warfare every believer is called to. You are called to spiritual warfare. Pastor established a definition of spiritual warfare, and this is what we're going to see through going throughout the series. And here's the definition. Daily Satan and his army of the kingdom of darkness are actively fighting against the kingdom of God, hoping to defeat God's will and destroy God's people. So last week, Pastor Taylor showed us how we are given a clear, we're given clear instructions to be strong in the strength of the Lord and to put on the whole armor of God. Why? It was the first principle he gave us. He says, you need to be strong in the Lord, this is what the word says, and the strength of his might, because you are called into a battle against the enemy you're no match for. You have no foot against the devil. Not without the Lord. So we learn. The fight has nothing to do with our own ability to overcome the powers of sin and darkness. Just like we depend on God to save us from our sins, we can't, because we can't save ourselves. So what makes you think we can go up against a formidable, formidable foe? We can't even save ourselves from God's wrath on our sin. We have to depend on God's grace and power to save us from the devil and his schemes. The devil and his schemes is what we're going to be focusing on today. The devil and his schemes is what we're going to look at as we continue part two. 
check this. Today's title is called, I want you to listen, then we're going to repeat it. Satan, stay scheming. Repeat it with me. Satan, Satan stay, stay scheming. scheming. He's always scheming. That's the title. We have two points today. The first one is, when it comes to spiritual warfare, we are to withstand and stand, here's the first one, against the devil. To withstand and stand against the devil. The devil, also referred to as Satan, meaning the adversary of God, the adversary, was once a chief angel, the uh, uh, anointed cherub, the star of morning who sparkled from top to bottom with precious jewels and stones. He was sparkling in heaven. He was created to magnify the glory of God. And then one day he rebelled against God, his creator, attempting to steal God's very own glory. He first appears in scripture as a serpent while in the garden, right? We're familiar with that story. A garden of Eden, he becomes a serpent. He's spoken of as a personal being by many of the apostles and even Jesus. In fact, we read in Matthew 4 when Jesus was tempted by Satan. He's responsible for opposing God's word, perverting God's word, hindering the gospel, and appearing as an angel of light. He's in part responsible for sin entering the world, and because of it, the entire world now lies in his power. The Bible describes Satan with personal names like the, the ruler of demons, the ruler of this world, the God of this world, the ruler of the power of the air, and so many other names. He is identified as the great dragon, a roaring lion, the vile one, the tempter, the accuser, even the spirit working in the sons of disobedience. He is called Satan 52 times in the Bible. And the devil, he's called the devil 35 times, which also means slander. He currently goes to and from, along with the rest of the fallen angels, tempting and corrupting humanity, and he's been doing that ever since the fall. They're evil, formidable, they're cunning, they're powerful, they're invisible to the human eye. Who in our own power can go up against that? We're no match for that, as we discovered. So now that we are aware that it, it, it's not in our strength, it's in God's strength that we must face this spiritual battle and we know somewhat of who we're up against now that we have this little description there, it's time to discuss what exactly are we up against. It brings us to our point two. We must withstand and stand against his schemes. Have you ever wondered how does Satan actually attack God? By attacking us through his schemes. The word schemes here in this text is translated from the Greek word methodia, which translates as the word methods in English. Better yet, strategies. We'll say that too. This word carries the idea of craftiness, cunning, and deception. Have you ever watched one of the videos on Animal Planet or, or, or YouTube or whatever, or even in real life, an animal lie and stalk its prey? And it's just wait. It got the patience all day <laughs> until that one moment where it just pounces right on that prey. That is exactly the description of how Satan is after you and I and every single believer with his methods, with his schemes. His schemes are built around stealth and deception. His devices, they, 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 they may be quite intimidating, but just as we know that he has a profile on us, because he's profiling us, we are to build that profile on him. It's an imperative to build a profile on Satan and his methods in order to know when we may be under attack. There are many schemes of the devil that he uses to assault us 
And today we'll, we will attempt to describe a number of them as well as what we are to do when we are in such times of trial. Because this is valuable intel we have here. So, what do we learn about Satan and his schemes? Well, we learn from the story of Job that Satan has power over nature. Now, don't get me wrong, don't get my words misconstrued. I didn't say that he is in control of nature and the elements. I said he has power over nature in some sense. You see, but we, we, we do see when he is allowed to impact Job's life, what happens? All these natural disasters start to happen. He even sends this great wind, maybe it was a hurricane, to destroy and inflict pain and devastation on Job by killing his kids. In Job 1, 8, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, While he was yet speaking, it was some guy that came and was telling Job all the things that was happening. There came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, this also doesn't mean that Satan is behind all natural disasters. I'm not saying that either. But when they're loud, he will use those powers. When they're at his disposal, he's going to use them. But don't forget, don't forget our Lord, who when the storms on the sea was getting so crazy, what did he do? He got up and he said what? He's the stick. Our Lord is in control of all nature. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about Satan and, and what he can do when we know our Lord is more powerful and he controls the, the nature just by speaking, just by speaking. Another one of Satan's methods is he has the ability to inhabit and possess man and animal. We are told in Hebrews that angels sometimes take on the form of human beings. So he does have the ability, but time and time again, we see Jesus and the apostles, what are they doing? They're casting out demons and, and, and demonic spirits from people. So they do have the ability to possess people. Like we see in, in Luke chapter 8, as well as in Mark, we see the encounter of Jesus and a demon-possessed man from the uh, Gerardine or the Gerasenes. And we find out that this man, he was called Legion because he had thousands and thousands upon thousands of demons in, in him, possessing him. And so Jesus comes to him and he comes to cast out those demons and the demons speak to Jesus and say, okay, you can cast us out, that's cool, but can we just go over there into that swine, that, that big old herd of pigs over there, can we, can we just go in there? And so whatever, Jesus casts all those demons out and they go into the pigs and they inhabit the pigs and the pigs go over the cliff. But what we see in that picture is that the demonic presence, the evil forces that are insane, they do have that ability to possess and to inhabit humans and even animals. Remember in the garden, he was the serpent, right? So Satan and his dark forces may be able to take the form of human and even possess creation. But let us never forget that we serve Jesus, who is creator of all. As it says in John 1, 3, all things were made through him, and without him was nothing or not anything made that was made. Jesus our creator. He is in control of all creation. The Bible says that we may entertain angels in our life, but that doesn't mean just good angels. Remember that. We may entertain God's angels, but we also may be entertaining Satan and his fallen angels. As we continue looking at the tricks of Satan, Scripture points out this. It says that Satan also likes to attack the mind of man. He likes to attack the mind of man, and he also likes to blind the minds of men. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us that in their case, the God of this world, remember that was a nickname for Satan, 
The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to do what? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I got a quote here for you. It is the supreme achievement of the devil to persuade man that at the point where he is most muddled and enslaved, he is most free. Satan will get us down to that point where he will play mind games with us. He wants to blind everyone who isn't saved, everyone who hasn't professed Jesus as Lord and Savior, they are blind. Their minds have been blinded. Praise God, he's keeping some, us here in order that we can proclaim this good news. In order that they may see the light. Think of all the people who boast they are not Christians because they have great minds. You know, it's, it's hard to feel sorry for them because of their pride. People bragging about, oh, I'm, I'm smarter than that. I don't need that. I have all this intellect. People who brag about those things. It's hard, it's hard to feel sorry for people who are so puffed up in knowledge that they can't see their own foolish ways. But you know what? We should have much compassion on them. Why? Because Satan has blinded them from seeing the truth. That was our problem, too. We were blinded once, too. We should have pity on anyone we come before. We were all in the same shoes. But aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that Jesus does not leave us blinded in spiritual darkness? He came to rescue man from the cusp of Satan and his demonic reign and to usher in the light that eliminates all spiritual darkness, leading man to repentance. Aren't you glad Jesus proclaimed he was what? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. Praise God. Here's, another, here's, a, here's a big one that Satan tries to hit us with and attack us with. The spirit of fear. Mm. Fear. As many of us know, fear is one of the greatest manipulators. It will make you do things you said you would never do, as well as it will immobilize you so that you don't do what you ought to. Remember during the Last Supper, Jesus was sharing with the apostles and he was telling Peter some things, and you know, Peter running his mouth, you know what I mean? He was trying to tell him that Satan asked to sift them like wheat. He wanted them. He desired to get go after them. And, and uh, Jesus is telling this to Peter, and here's what Peter says, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go with you. I'm ready to go to prison and die. I'm, I'm ready. I will follow you, Jesus. Say whatever. But what happens? What do we find out later? We see the contrast later that Satan gave Peter that fear of losing his life. He wasn't so quick to lose his life with Jesus later on, was he? When they were out there in the dark. <clears throat> you know, if you follow God in this area, you know, Satan will try to tempt you or try to uh, deceive you with your obedience to God. Meaning, he will say something or something in your head will pop up like this. You know, if you follow God in this area, you can lose something really dear to you. Why? Because Jesus calls us to what? Take up our cross daily, right? Of course, yes. Yeah, we might, we might just lose something. Or he says, you can't confess that sin because you'll lose the reputation. you you lose your wife, your family. You can't confess that. And so he's putting these things of fear into us and we're immobilized and we can't move and now we're acting as we are, you know, all, everything is all good, but inside we are tore down. Satan is moving that way. But guess what? Listen, saying we must remember, though we can cower and we can cave into fear, guess what? We have not been given the spirit of fear. For the scripture says in 2 Timothy 1.17, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, 
but of power and love and self-control. You don't have to be afraid of him. You don't have the spirit of fear. This means we can firmly walk in obedience to God, not fearing what will come your way or worrying about compromising your spiritual integrity. Because God is not giving you the spirit of fear. Satan also likes to use many other tactics in his assaults. False teachings, evil thoughts and imaginations that, that come only when you're reading your Bible, when you're, when you're trying to pray. You ever get those, where the heck did that come from? I'm trying to be holy right now. <laughs> but those things do happen. They come from him. Discouragement and depression. And that's, that's not to say that he's behind all the pressure. But he's impacting us in such ways. So we got to be careful how we diagnose, you know, if, if Satan is attacking us and, and, and when. But he does move in those ways. He makes us concentrate on ourselves way too much. He makes us oh, go overboard with some, some of the most silliest of things. Our past sins, especially. He makes us concentrate on the things that you have already been forgiven for. You've been forgiven. First John 1 John 9, 119. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, if you've confessed to him that sin, you do not have to worry about that. Stop letting that hold you down and bog you down. You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. I'm encouraging you. Hang on to his promises. Remain in his promises because that's what's going to help us when we feel that spiritual depression coming on. Remember, God received the prodigal and the black backslider. Those who've walked away, those who stopped, God didn't just give up on them. He received them back. And Satan will stop at nothing to attack you in those times and those moments.